This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. The Blind Owl In this mean world of wretchedness and misery, I thought that for once a ray of sunlight had broken upon my life. Alas, it was not sunlight, but a passing gleam, a falling star, which flashed upon me in the form of a woman or of an angel. In its light, in the course of a second, of a single moment, I beheld all the wretchedness of my existence and apprehended the glory and splendor of the star. After, that brightness disappeared again in the whirlpool of darkness, in which it was bound inevitably to disappear. I was unable to retain that passing gleam. It is three months. No, it is two months and four days since I lost her from sight, but the memory of those magic eyes, of the fatal radiance of those eyes, has remained with me at all times. How can I forget her, who is so intimately bound up with my own existence? No, I shall never utter her name, for now, with her slender, ethereal, misty form, her great, shining, wondering eyes, in the depths of which my life has slowly and painfully burned and melted away, she no longer belongs to this mean, cruel world. No, I must not defile her name by contact with earthly things. After she had gone I withdrew from the company of man, from the company of the stupid, and the successful, life passed, and still passes, within the four walls of my room. All my life has passed within four walls. I used to work through the day, decorating the covers of pen cases. Or, rather, I spent on my trade of pen case decorator the time that I did not devote to wine and opium. I had chosen this ludicrous trade of pen case decorator only in order to stupefy myself, in order somehow or other to kill time. I am for fortunate in that the house where I live is situated beyond the edge of the city, in a quiet district far from the noise and bustle of life. It is completely isolated and around it lie ruins. Only on the far side of the gully, one can see a number of squat mud brick houses, which mark the extreme limit of the city. They must have been built by some fool or madman, heaven knows how long ago. When I shut my eyes not only can I see every detail of their structure, but I seem to feel the weight of them pressing on my shoulders. They are the sort of houses which one finds depicted only on the covers of ancient pen cases. I am obliged to set all this down on paper in order to disentangle the various threads of my story. I am obliged to explain it all for the benefit of my shadow on the wall. Yes, in the past only one consolation, and that a poor one, remained to me. Within the four walls of my room I painted my pictures on the pen cases and thereby, thanks to this ludicrous occupation of mine, managed to get through the day. But when once I had seen those two eyes, once I had seen her, activity of any sort lost all meaning, all content, all value for me. I would mention a strange, an incredible thing. For some reason unknown to me the subject of all my painting was from the very beginning one and the same. It consisted always of a cypress tree at the foot of which was squatting a bent old man like an Indian fakir. He had a long cloak wrapped about him and wore a turban on his head. The index finger of his left hand was pressed to his lips in a gesture of surprise. Before him stood a girl in a long black dress, leaning towards him and offering him a flower of morning glory. Between them ran a little stream. Had I seen the subject of this picture at some time in the past, or had it been revealed to me in a dream? I do not know. What I do know is that whenever I sat down to paint I reproduced the same design, the same subject. My hand independently of my will, always depicted the same scene. Strangest of all, I found customers for these paintings of mine. I even dispatched some of my pen case covers to India through the intermediary of my paternal uncle, who used to sell them and remit the money to me. Somehow I always felt this subject to be remote and, at the same time, curiously familiar to me. I don't remember very well. 
It occurs to me that I once said to myself that I must write down what I remember of all this, but that happened much later, and has nothing to do with the subject of my painting. Moreover, one consequence of this experience was that I gave up painting altogether. That was two months, or, rather exactly, two months and four days ago. It was the 13th day of Nuraz, the national festival of Iran. It begins on March 21st and lasts for 13 days. It is the custom to spend the last day of Nuraz picnicking in the country. Everyone had gone out to the country. I had shut the window of my room in order to be able to concentrate on my painting. It was not long before sunset, and I was working away, when suddenly the door opened, and my uncle came into the room. That is, he said he was my uncle. I had never seen my uncle in my life, for he had been abroad ever since his early youth. I seemed to remember that he was a sea captain. I imagined he might have some business matter to discuss with me, since I understood that he was interested in commerce as well. At all events my uncle was a bent old man, with an Indian turban on his head, and a ragged yellow cloak on his back. His face was partly concealed by a scarf wrapped around his neck. His shirt was open and revealed a hairy chest. It would have been possible to count the hairs of the sparse beard protruding from under the scarf which muffled his neck. His eyelids were red and sore, and he had a hair lip. He resembled me in a remote, comical way like a reflection in a distorting mirror. I had always pictured my father something like this. On entering the room he walked straight across to the opposite wall and squatted on the floor. It occurred to me that I ought to offer him some refreshment in honor of his arrival. I lit the lamp and went into the little dark closet, which opens off my room. I searched every corner in the hope of finding something suitable to offer him, although I knew there was nothing of the sort in the house. I had no, I had no opium or drink left. Suddenly my eye lighted on the topmost of the shelves on the wall. It was as though I had had a flash of inspiration. On the shelf stood a bottle of old wine, which had been left me by my parents. I seemed to remember hearing that it had been laid down on the occasion of my birth. There it was on the top shelf. I had never so much as given it a thought, and had quite forgotten there was such a thing in the house. To reach the shelf I got up onto a stool which happened to be there. As I reached towards the bottle, I chanced to look out through the ventilation hole above the shelf. On the open ground outside my room I saw a bent old man sitting at the foot of a cypress tree, with a young girl. No, an angel from heaven. Stand standing before him. She was leaning forward, and with her right hand was offering him a blue flower of morning glory. The old man was biting the nail of the index finger of his left hand. The girl was directly opposite me, but she appeared to be quite unaware of her surroundings. She was gazing straight ahead without looking at anything in particular. She wore on her lips a vague, involuntary smile, as though she was thinking of someone who was absent. It was then that I first beheld those frightening, magic eyes those eyes which seem to express a bitter reproach to mankind, with their look of anxiety and wonder, of menace and promise, and the current of my existence was drawn towards those shining eyes charged with manifold significance and sank into their depths. That magnetic mirror drew my entire being towards it with inconceivable force. They were slanting, Turkoman eyes of supernatural, intoxicating radiance which at once frightened and attracted as though they had looked upon terrible, transcendental things which it was given to no one but her to see. Her cheekbones were prominent and her forehead high. Her eyebrows were slender and met in the middle. Her lips were full and half open as though they had broken away only a moment before from a long, passionate kiss and were not yet sated. Her face, pale as the moon, was framed in the mass of her black, 
disheveled hair, and one strand clung to her temple. The fineness of her limbs, and the ethereal unconstraint of her movements marked her as one who was not fated to live long in this world. No one but a Hindu temple dancer could have possessed her harmonious grace of movement. Her air of mingled gaiety and sadness set her apart from ordinary mankind. Her beauty was extraordinary. She reminded me of a vision seen in an opium sleep. She aroused in me a heat of passion like that which is kindled by the mandrake root. It seemed to me as I gazed at her long, slender form, with its harmonious lines of shoulder, arms, breasts, waist, buttocks and legs, that she had been torn from her husband's embrace, that she was like the female mandrake which has been plucked from the arms of its mate. She was wearing a black pleated dress which clung tightly to her body. Gazing at her, I was certain that she wished to leap across the stream which separated her from the old man, but that she was unable to do so. All at once the old man burst into laughter. It was a hollow, grating laugh, of a quality to make the hairs of one's body stand on end, a harsh, sinister, mocking laugh. And yet the expression of his face did not change. It was as though the laughter was echoing from somewhere deep within his body. In terror I sprang down from the stool with the bottle in my hand. I was trembling, in a state of mingled horror, and delight, such as might have been produced by some delicious, fearful dream. I set the bottle of wine down on the floor, and held my head in my hands. How many minutes, how many hours I remained thus, I do not know. When I came to myself I picked up the bottle, and went back into my room. My uncle had gone, and had left the room door agape like the mouth of a dead man. The sound of the old man's hollow laughter was still echoing in my ears. It was growing dark. The lamp was burning smokily. I could still feel the aftermath of the delicious, horrible fit of trembling which I had experienced. From that moment the course of my life had changed. With one glance, that angel of heaven, that ethereal girl, had left on me the imprint of her being, more deeply marked than the mind of man can conceive. At that moment I was in a state of trance. It seemed to me that I had long known her name. The radiance of her eyes, her complexion, her perfume, her movements, all appeared familiar to me, as though, in some previous existence in a world of dreams, my soul had lived side by side with hers, had sprung from the same root, and the same stock, and it was inevitable that we should be brought together again. It was inevitable that I should be close to her in this life. At no time did I desire to touch her. The invisible rays which emanated from our bodies and mingled together were sufficient contact. As for the strange fact that she appeared familiar to me from the first glance, do not lovers always experience the feeling that they have seen each other before, and that a mysterious bond has long existed between them? The only thing in this mean world which I desired was her love, if that were denied me I wanted the love of nobody. Was it possible that anyone other than she should make any impression upon my heart? But the hollow grating laughter, the sinister laughter of the old man had broken the bond which united us. All that night I thought about these things. Again and again I was on the point of going to look through the aperture in the wall, but fear of the old man's laughter held me back. The next day also I could think of nothing else. Would I be able to refrain altogether from going to look at her? Finally on the third day I decided, despite the dread which possessed me, to put the bottle of wine back in its place. But when I drew the curtain aside, and looked into the closet I saw in front of me a wall as blank and dark as the darkness which has enshrouded my life. There was no trace of aperture or window. The rectangular opening had been filled in, had merged with the wall, as though it had never existed. I stood upon the stool but, although I hammered on the wall with my fists, listening intently, although I held the lamp to it, and examined it with care, 
there was not the slightest trace of any aperture. My blows had no more effect upon the solid, massive fabric of the wall than if it had been a single slab of lead. Could I abandon the hope of ever seeing her again? It was not within my power to do so. Henceforth I lived like a soul in torment. All my waiting, watching and seeking were in vain. I trod every hand's breadth of ground in the neighborhood of my house. I was like the murderer who returns to the scene of his crime. Not one day, not two days, but every day for two months, and four days I circled around our house in the late afternoon like a decapitated fowl. I came to know every stone and every pebble in the neighborhood, but I found no trace of the cypress tree, of the little stream, or of the two people whom I had seen there. The same number of nights I knelt upon the ground in the moonlight, I begged and entreated the trees, the stones and the moon. For she might have been gazing at that moment at the moon. I sought, I sought aid from every created thing, but I found no trace of her. In the end I understood that all my efforts were useless, because it was not possible that she should be connected in any way with the things of this world, the water with which she washed her hair came from some unique, unknown spring, her dress was not woven of ordinary stuff, and had not been fashioned by material, human hands. She was a creature apart. I realized that those flowers of morning glory were no ordinary flowers. I was certain that if her face were to come into contact with ordinary water it would fade, and that if she were to pluck an ordinary flower of morning glory with her long fine fingers they would wither like the petals of a flower. I understood all this. This girl, this angel, was for me a source of wonder and ineffable revelation. Her being was subtle and intangible. She aroused in me a feeling of adoration. I felt sure that beneath the glance of a stranger, of an ordinary man, she would have withered and crumpled. Ever since I had lost her, ever since the aperture had been blocked, and I had been separated from her by a heavy wall, a dank barrier as massive as a wall of lead, I felt that my existence had become pointless, that I had lost my way for all time to come. Even though the caress of her gaze and the profound delight I had experienced in seeing her had been only momentary and devoid of reciprocity. For she had not seen me. Yet I felt the need of those eyes. One glance from her would have been sufficient to make plain all the problems of philosophy and the riddles of theology. One glance from her and mysteries and secrets would no longer have existed for me. From this time on I increased my doses of wine and opium, but alas, those remedies of despair failed to numb and paralyze my mind. I was unable to forget. On the contrary, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, the memory of her, of her body, of her face, took shape in my mind more clearly than before. How could I have forgotten her? Whether my eyes were open or closed, whether I slept or woke, she was always before me. Through the opening in the closet wall, like the dark night, which enshrouds the mind and reason of man, through the rectangular aperture, which looked onto the outside world, she was ever before my eyes. Repose was utterly denied me. How could I have found repose? It had become a habit with me to go out for a walk every day just before sunset. For some obscure reason I wanted desperately to find the little stream, the cypress tree, and the vine of morning glory. I had become addicted to these walks in the same way as I had become addicted to opium. It was as though I was compelled by some outside force to undertake them. Throughout my walk I would be immersed in the thought of her, in the memory of my first glimpse of her, and I desired to find the place where I had seen her on that thirteenth day of Nuras, if I should find that place, if it should be granted to me to sit beneath that cypress tree, then for sure I should attain peace. But alas, there was nothing but sweepings, burning sand, horse bones and refuse heaps around which dogs were sniffing. Had I ever really encountered her? Never. 
All that had happened was that I had looked furtively, covertly at her through a hole, a cursed aperture in my closet wall. I was like a hungry dog sniffing and rooting in a refuse heap. When people come to dump garbage on the pile, he runs away and hides, only to return later to renew his search for tasty morsels. This was the state that I was in. But the aperture in the wall was blocked. For me the girl was like a bunch of fresh flowers, which has been tossed onto a refuse heap. This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Anchor. Breaker. Overcast. Pocket Casts. Radio Public. Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.